One thing to remember, uh, you know, there's lots of credentials as we popping up, as we know, but there's still a credential that remains uh, very important that doesn't always get put into those uh, discussions about disruption and credentials, and that's the degree. And of course, the universities are the primary, well, the only uh, issuer of those credentials, but they've also now are getting uh, themselves more well-rounded, issuing different credentials and certificates as well. Uh, so we thought it was really important to have uh, a university representation not only in the audience, but of course on the stage. So I'm very excited to, to welcome uh, Ronald Mason, Jr. He served as president of the University of District of Columbia since 2015. UDC is a very unique university that also houses a community college, uh, and its institution serves as a critical access point in this region uh, for those looking for higher ed. <clears throat> We're very pleased to have president here today. Prior coming into UDC, Mr. Mason was the seventh president of the Southern University and A&M College System, which is the only historically black university system in the United States. Briefly, he also served as president of Jackson State University. Uh, and earlier in his career, he served 18 years at Tulane, where he held appointments as senior vice president and general counsel and as vice president for finance and operations. <clears throat> Among the many other awards and activities he's been involved in, President Mason has served on the president's board of advisors for HBCUs. He served on the National Advisory Committee on Institutional Quality and Integrity and the American Council on the Education Board of Directors. Uh, he's received both his BA and his Juris Doctorate degree from Columbia University. So again, very excited to have him here and share from perspective. Please welcome President Mason. Uh, good afternoon. How's everybody this afternoon? Um, I thought a lot about uh, what I wanted to say um, to this group. Uh, but after hearing the prior speaker, I think I'm going to modify it a little bit uh, and talk, add a little bit about Adderall and, <laughs> and uh, credentialing and so on and so forth. Um, but let me just uh, see who I'm talking to. Now, how many folks here are from the district? Can you raise your hand? Oh, good. Oh, good. So it's a, it's a district crowd. And me being the university of the district, that's important for me to know who I'm talking to. Um, let me... Um, let me start with Adderall. And so uh, I had a son in middle school uh, who, um, by all observations, was a bright young man. But he'd make A's and F's. And depending on the semester, he might switch up which course he had an A in or an F in, right? And he was, uh, he was diagnosed with ADHD. And we put him on Adderall. And after a couple of months, he just refused to take it again. He said, Dad, look, I just don't like the way it makes me feel. Uh, and so we didn't force him. And at the end of the day, um, he ended up graduating from high school with honors, uh, per scored a perfect score on his SAT, uh, got a full ride to an engineering scholarship where he went to college and proceeded to make A's and F's. Um, and so now he's uh, traveling a road that uh, will take me to um, the next thing I want to talk about, which is uh, the work we're doing at the University of the District of Columbia. And I'm going to have a few slides to, to walk us through that. But we've been doing a lot of time, spending a lot of time thinking about uh, what higher education should be. Um, and, you know, in the past, it's been sort of a, a highway where you have one on ramp and you travel to one exit and then you get off with a degree. Uh, but we're starting to understand more and more that it's, it's more like a series of on and off ramps. And uh, in order to be able to serve the students that we in particular serve, we have to think through, you know, how to enable that student to reach his or her or their highest level of human potential, um, which changes over time, which means that they may be in one place potential-wise at one stage of their life, but then need to get back on and reach a higher level. And we'll talk about that a little bit. But in order to do that, we had to sort of rethink um, this, this question of credentialing. Uh, because uh, one of the other things we're going to talk about is that, you know, the education system in America really is about, um, it, it's a mining operation. You know, we identify, we extract, uh, and we refine and produce and put out into the market uh, human talent. 
That's our job. And uh, what I'm going to talk about a little bit later on is that we've been very narrow in our ability to do that work, uh, which is why America has a talent crisis today. Uh, we have workers, but we don't have as talent. We don't have people who are reaching the highest level of their potential to serve the economy that our, our nation needs to, uh, to develop. And so um, one of the new programs that we just, just put in place is something called the Capital Builders, uh, the Capital Builders Center. And what it is, it's, um, it's a program where we use a Gallup tool, Gallup, uh, the Gallup Poll Organization, uh, to identify uh, the top 20 high school graduates in the district who have a knack for entrepreneurship. Um, and it's an it's a interesting assessment, too, because unlike standardized tests, typical standardized tests, you know, and I do a lot of work with the Educational Testing Service, uh, with the Council for the Advancement of Aid to Education, which has their own assessment, too. There are a lot of assessment tools out there. And really, all they are are tools to determine whether or not someone is qualified to do whatever it is you're asking them to do. Uh, but this particular, and all, most of them are race and gender uh, correlated. Not race and gender, race and class correlated. But this particular tool, BP-10, isn't. Uh, and so we administered it to, well, as many uh, high school graduates as we could, public high school in the country, I mean in the district. And, um, and we found the top 20, but what we, what we noticed was that uh, we have a great deal of difficulty finding students from Ward 8 and Ward 7 in the district. Those are the two poorest wards in the district. But when we gave this uh, race and class neutral assessment, it turned out that some of the highest scorers on this assessment came from Ward 7 and 8. Um, which brings me uh, back to my son because we realized that um, students that make A's and F's really, generally speaking, end up being entrepreneurs. Uh, they don't make A's and B's, they make A's and F's because they're very smart, but they're also very high risk takers. Uh, and so this particular assessment uh, sort of cuts through that, at least we hope it does. We're starting to sort of study it. Um, but what it also identifies is something they call grit. You know, a, a spirit of determination to do whatever it is you set your mind to do. And so the byproduct of this tool we're hoping is that not only will we identify uh, students who have a high knack for entrepreneurship, but also who have the grit to overcome the challenges that these young people have coming out of Ward 7 and 8 to get the ultimate goal, which is a bachelor's degree, which is really the credential that our nation uh, needs. So having said that, um, let me just say a little bit about now about the equity imperative. Um, I'm going to see if the slides work. And so we've been, as I said, rethinking the university. And if you're from the district, you've probably heard this phrase from our mayor more than once. Uh, we need to put more people on the pathway to the middle class. Um, and uh, we made the case to the mayor that in the district, the pathway to the middle class, which is education, and I'll show you why, um, really is a four-lane highway up through the 12th grade, and then it turns into a one-lane dirt road with a lot of potholes at the, at the end of the public education pipeline, which is the University of the District of Columbia. It will explain why there as well. Um, but the crowning moment of this effort, we, we, we took this slide all over the district, we turned it into a political campaign in order to get the resources we need, needed to do the work. But at the uh, State of the Union, um, State of the District address, uh, the mayor um, made a statement that was dear to my heart. She said, uh, the president of UDC has finally got me to understand that higher education doesn't stop, that public education doesn't stop at the 12th grade. And so uh, with that, we got some money to actually get the work done that we needed to do. And so the, 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 the sub-theme here is um, completing the pathways to the middle class. And the mayor directly, uh, correctly noted that education is the, 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 the primary pathway to get there. Let's see now. I'm not sure what I'm clicking at. Is it here? Is it here? 
Where's my tech guy? Here we go. Good. I got it. And so, um, you know, in America, median middle class income is uh, $59,000. But in the district, it's $75,000. Um, uh, medium household incomes, if you break it down by race, if you are white, it's 127, Asian, 99, Latino, 64, and black is $37,000. And so you can see, let me give you another, another little slide here. And so in the district, the median salaries are 60,000. With a bachelor's degree, you earn 65. With a high school degree, you earn 30. But look at the distribution of those credentials uh, only 25% of African Americans, 40% of Latinos have some sort of college level credential, but uh, if you're white, 92% have, have that credential. And so, um, you know, these folks that look like this uh, really are the ones that need a pathway to the middle class. And they want to experience the same type of middle class values that everybody else does. Um, let me see here. You got me here? Good. If I do this and it doesn't work, just, just do it. Um, and their, their pathway is public education, because in the district, um, the P-12 system is 70% African American, 17% Latino, and 80% economically disadvantaged. Or, oh, too many, too fast. Uh, and that feeds directly into the only public university in the district, which is the University of the District of Columbia, where we're 60% African American, 10% Latino, and 40% economically disadvantaged. But 65% of our students are uh, de degree-seeking students or district residents, and 100% of our workforce development students are district residents. One of the unique things about UDC is that we really have three doors in. Uh, we have a workforce training door that is free to every district resident. We have a community college door that is open enrollment. And we have a selective admissions door. Uh, but, but the point is that the university we're designing, every door will lead to the next door. When I, when I talked about on and off ramps, you know, some will come to us with the potential for a workforce certification. But then in that process, the light will go off, and they'll get into an associate's degree program. And then that light will go off again, and they'll end up getting a bachelor's degree. And we've had several uh, that have, have already gone through that entire process. Um, but their pathway is incomplete, because uh, how many people here remember the control board? So in the, in, the, in the late 90s, the federal government took over the district, uh, had to uh, cut the government budget fired a lot of people, reset the future. Uh, but Alice Rivlin, who chaired the control board for a, a few years, made this statement recently, uh, that of all the cuts they made, uh, in hindsight, she felt like the cuts to the University of the District of Columbia were much too deep. Now, since then, the district has sort of reset itself. And if you've noticed, they've reinvested in most of the major institutions. The libraries are becoming world class. Uh, the parks and recreation system are becoming world class. Uh, the public uh, K-12 facilities and some of the schools are becoming world class. The one thing that they left off the list was, was the public university, which in a way ties it all together. Um, but I'm happy to say that uh, this campaign we did was successful, and the mayor uh, announced that she uh, was going to make a down payment on the strategic plan that we have in place. And that down payment was pretty good, so now we can start to join the ranks of the other world-class institutions in the district. Now, and this is not a heavy lift, uh, because if in the district, uh, we spent only 1.1% of our local funds budget on public higher education. That's compared to 3.8% in um, one of those is Virginia, one is Maryland, and the 5.8% is national. And all we're asking to do is go from, oh, let me go back, and, oh, and even with that lower level of investment, that very low investment, 
you know, depending on who you ask, we're doing a pretty good job. Um, we're not going to ever be in the top 10 U.S. News and World Report schools in America. And that's because we don't want to be. Uh, we're not the Harvard. We're sort of the anti-Harvard. Harvard's expensive, it's elite, and it's very exclusive. We want to educate everybody that walks in our door and help them reach their highest level of human potential at an affordable price. Uh, and so we have all these neat national rankings which sort of speak to the kind of institution that we are. And where's my backup? And so at the end of the day, all we really asked to do was go from 1.1% to 1.72% over four years, and I think we'll end up getting there. Now, um, and if we can, with a variety of credentialing options, you know, we believe that we can do a, make a, a big dent in the level of talent that's developed to serve the economy of the district. Um, and let me just speak a second about our, uh, this graduation rate up here. You see, we say, it's 17% now, and we think it'll get up to 54% by 2028. Um, but here's the, here's the point of it. So graduation rates in America are, 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 are come from a national uh, definition, and it is the number of students that start in year X and how many of them graduate six years later, right? Um, and so in our case, we have 2,000 students coming in in their freshman year, but only 500 of them are actually first-time, full-time freshmen that you can expect to graduate six years later. Uh, and for that group, um, on a bachelor's track, it's about a 35% graduation rate, which is not great, but I've seen worse. But then we have the open enrollment door, which we call a community college, um, and that's a three-year graduation rate, three years later, and for that group, it's about a 7% graduation rate because it's open enrollment. Um, but that, that's not great, but it's not bad either compared to other community colleges I've seen. So the graduation rate is a blended rate with open enrollment and bachelor's track, and that's why we end up at 17%. But the point is this. Uh, how many people know what the TAG scholarships are? Those are, those, are grant, those are federal scholarships that go to high school graduates in the district to go to school anywhere but UDC anywhere in the country but UDC. And so um, a lot of them, though, end up leaving and coming back to UDC. Uh, but they don't count toward the graduation rate because they didn't start as freshmen at UDC. Uh, we're also very, very heavily part-time because a lot of our students work. Uh, part-time students don't count toward the graduation rate. Uh, and then um, well, there's another one in there, but you get the point. Uh, the point is that uh, we're never going to win a graduation rate contest because we just don't have those kinds of students that we educate. Oh, we also don't have uh, student apartments, which makes the education challenge even, even more difficult. So I needed to explain that. But at the end of the day, we think we can double or triple the number of credentialed, qualified people that come out of public education in the district if the mayor keeps her word and continues the investment into UDC. Now, those are the local challenges that we've been able to overcome, right? Uh, but there's a big national sort of structural challenge uh, that I want to talk a little bit about. Um, and I want to engage you in the conversation as much as I can, because this is something that I've had a growing insight into. And, um, and there was recently an article in Atlantic Magazine. I don't know if you all saw it. Uh, it was called um, the New Aristocracy, the 9.9 percent. Did anybody see that or read it? Okay, you should read this. It's about 50 pages long. Uh, so if you're on a train somewhere and you're looking for something good to read, uh, it would be a good read. Uh, but it, I think it helps explain uh, something I've been trying to figure out uh, for several years now. And let me explain to you what it is. So uh, in public education, right? Uh, we always talk about public education reform. And I've been around this industry uh, uh, to see about three cycles of reform. And what happens is that uh, the students are not getting educated, and then there's a public outcry, there's outrage, and then there's a call for reform, 
And then these industries crop up to try to figure out what's wrong, to try to develop products to solve the problem, to try to be consultants on how to fix the schools to fix the problem. And then at the end of the day, it doesn't work. And there's a public outrage. And the cycle starts again. Uh, and I've been through about three of these cycles. And I've, I, you know, I, I kept asking myself, you know, if you listen to what the prior speaker said about the wealth uh, that's available to us, about the modern tools that are available to us, about the nation's need for talent, um, you know, you have to ask yourself, why can't we figure out a way to fix our public education system? And I think it has something to do with that article about um, the new aristocracy and the talented tenth. And so one of the other things we, we've learned at uh, UDC and we're trying to get the faculty to buy into is that you know, our students um, come from a different world from that, that we can even imagine. And um, you know, if you're my age, you, we have as much to learn from them as they have to learn from us. And so we're trying to trans transition our teaching methodology from being a, sa a sage on the stage to a guide on the side. Uh, where it's a teaching and learning environment and we understand that we walk this journey with the student uh, and that we have as much to learn as they have to teach and vice versa and that even that student that comes in as a freshman today will be a different student four years from now because the world is changing so fast. Um, and so I want you to be, um, uh, 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 we want to be each other's guides on the side as I work through this, this piece that I'm about to work through now. And so, so this is the cover. This is the cover of the magazine, right? And it's called uh, the 9.9 percent, the new American aristocracy. The class divide is already toxic, and it's fast becoming unbridgeable. And you're probably part of the problem. Now, um, which means us. I'm going to try to work as much as I can from this slide. There's other slides, but I think I, think I can tr kind of explain it from here. And so this is the way America is divided up. 0.1% um, of the uh, population, about 160,000 households, own and control about 22% of the wealth in 2012, right? And 90% uh, of the wealth is allocated to or, or in the hands of, I'm sorry, yeah, in the hand, I'm sorry, scratch that. 35% of the wealth is in the hands of about 90% of the population, okay? And so that's 45% of the wealth in basically 90.1% of the population. But the 9.9%, uh, the, the ones in the middle, control most of the wealth as a group. And that's 55%. Um, and in that 55%, the median net worth is about $2.4 million, um, which is 25 times the median net worth of the people in the 90%. You follow me? And in that 9.9%, 88% .9%, uh, are white, OK? Uh, which would make perfect sense, you know, because we live in a country that's built on a philosophy of uh, white privilege. It's just, just a fact. And so what happens is that um, if you notice from 1930 to 2010, um, the wealth of the top 1%, the goal line, right, uh, was high and then it dipped and it went back up again. And then the wealth of the bottom 90% was about in the same place in 1930. And then it went up and it came back down again, OK? But the wealth of the 9.9% .9 stayed fairly steady. And so the transfer of wealth in this country really takes place between the highest and the lowest uh, parts of our society. Um, and if you look at what's happening now with the tax code and, and other things that are going on, 
you can see this gold line continuing to go up and the black line continuing to go down, right? And so this is sort of the way America is set up. But the point of uh, the article is this. It's that the 9.9% um, are the beneficiaries of our system of education. Because remember I said earlier that we've become very skilled at identifying, extracting, and developing a very specific type of talent. And that specific type of talent is the talent that's in that 9.9%, which is why our standardized tests, generally speaking, correlate uh, to race and class, uh, which is why our best schools end up being populated with these types of students, and which is why it's very difficult for us to get people out of that 90%, uh, which is more and more becoming black and brown, but not just black and brown, but get them out of that 90% into the 9.9%, because it's a fully integrated system, and it's really two different mining operations. Uh, the one is built to mine the 9.9%, and the other is built to mine the, um, the, the 90%. Are you following me on this? So let me, um, I'm gonna, there's a lot of language in the next slides, but I'm gonna try to condense each one of them, right? And so the way this works out, trying to click, is um, you know, equal, economic mobility really uh, isn't what it appears to be in this country. You know, the American dream is, a, it, it works for the people who already live in the dream. Uh, but the ones that aren't living the dream, generally speaking, never get out of that 90%. If you're born in it, you tend to stay in it. Um, and this is just a, a way to calculate that. It's the IGE, which is the intergenerational earnings elasticity. It basically says what your, how, much, how much more your child's going to make than you, than your parents do. At UDC, we're proud to say that our students uh, end up, we're like 99th in the country for raising that, that, that income level, but that speaks as much to where our parents' income level are as it does to where our students end up. But look at America. Um, America has one of the, the worst IGEs in, uh, in the world, um, and it's because of some of the things we're going to talk about. Uh, let me get, get, get another one. Uh, and so um, only 2% of the nation's Students graduate from private high schools, for example, um, but 28% of them uh, end up at Harvard and Princeton. Um, 5,000 elementary schools in California, the top 11, which also sends students to Harvard and Princeton's type schools, uh, have a median income value of the homes of $3 million. Uh, half Ivy League graduates end up being finance, management, consulting, medicine, lawyers. Um, but if you ask economists how they keep their income levels high, they'll tell you that um, you know, the med medical field is really a cartel. You know, they limit the number of people that can end up being doctors so that they can keep their income high. And the same thing with the Bar Association. And be me being a, for a former lawyer, I can sort of confirm that much. Uh, and then this is a cute line from the, um, from, the, from the article. Five minutes? Really? Oh, man. So imagine, <laughs> imagine if workers hired consultants and compensation committees consisting of their peers at other companies to recommend how they should be paid. The result would be, well, we know what it would be because that's exactly what CEOs do. So um, I'm going to have to cut it short now. But the point is this, the point is this. Um, we have to figure out a way to identify, extract, refine, and produce the talent that the nation needs. And most of the talent is in that 90%. But when you live in a, in a system, right, that's designed to minimize who has access to the means of talent development, to our own detriment, you're going to lose a lot of the talent along the way. And so the real challenge for us is, you know, how do we, how do we 
overcome our comfort, our security, our fear of letting others in to the 9.9% in order to be able to find a way to extract these vast, uh, suppressed, often hidden reserves of talent that our nation has but doesn't really know how to develop. It's pretty much the idea. I'll leave the other slides for you, but even better, read the article. I thought it was a really good article. Um, and then I had some more about UDC, but I guess you want to do five minutes of uh, so this is what the middle class should look like if, you, if we did, did it correctly. Um, you know, everybody represented an equitable portion. And so to wrap it up, the next one is, uh, wait, no, go back. And the next one is, yes, if we get our job done correctly, then UDC really will be uh, the pathway to the middle class. Questions? Yes, sir. Um, so do your graduates stay in D.C. to be able to work, or are they leaving D.C. to then uh, pursue careers in other areas? You know, it's interesting. We have, we're actually about 10% uh, international, and they come a lot with the intention of going back home. Uh, we have a better reputation outside of the district than we do in the district, and so a lot of them come and go back home. Uh, but most of, most of our students are from the district and most of them uh, end up staying in or around the district, as far as we know. Yeah, our, our data systems aren't quite there yet, but with the new investment, we'll start to have that data more available. Yes, sir. Um, how are you marketing for students or residents in the district to go to UBC, whether it's the workforce program or the community college? Yeah, so you'll be seeing a uh, major marketing campaign coming out. Um, soon, because we're putting it together as we speak with the new investment that we have. Uh, but one of the things we've been able to do is we started something called uh, DC University Partnership so that uh, students could start to see UDC as a first choice. And so any public or public charter school graduate with a 3.0 or above gets some sort of scholarship. If you're a 3.7 or a valedictorian or a salutatorian, you get a full scholarship and you get um, housing. And so the first year we had 40, um, this year we had 120, next year we're expecting a couple of hundred. And I say that to say this, um, you know, these are high-end, highly qualified students, which will not only drive up our graduation rate over time, because their, their, their uh, retention rate is hitting the 80, 90 percent mark, but also your best recruiters are the students that you, that come to your school and go back and talk to the students at the high school. And so um, that's part of our marketing campaign as well, to answer your question. Yes, ma'am. Yes, you said more about how you are envisioning the redesigned pathways from the workforce to the community college. Is that something that you are currently working on? Yes. Or are you going to continue to work on that? Sure. I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, we have a partnership with Cisco, um, the technology group. And so um, at the workforce training level, entry level certification, uh, we have a program for that, uh, that group of, 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 of talent. Uh, but that curriculum is actually uh, seamlessly collect, connected to an associate's degree. So that if you get certified at that level, you can move on to the associate's level or you can leave and work and come back. And then the associate's level is uh, connected to the bachelor's level. Please. Yeah, so I'll give you another example. Um, we just were about to start a PhD. It would be our second in um, urban leadership and entrepreneurship because uh, we're going to claim the urban space. Um, we're, we're a land grant that is exclusively urban, which is unique in the country. And 80% of the world is going to be urban in the next 40 something years, right? So we're claiming that space. We're starting this PhD, but we're partnering with Fielding University. Uh, Fielding University has a couple of, is very good at a couple of things that we want to be able to do. Uh, one is online learning. 
The second, though, is uh, credit for uh, credential credentialing based on uh, workforce expertise. And so you can get academic credit, which I think is what you're asking, uh, toward, the, uh, act, toward the PhD degree based on our assessment of how much uh, experience, expertise you have that can be applied toward that work. Uh, is that your question? No, okay. Yeah. Well, I, I think it's more than that, though. Um, I, first, I do believe there's a place for liberal learning in general, right? But also, um, and, and I think the prior speaker said it, um, you know, at the end of the day, if you ask employers what they really want, they want students who can read, who can write, who can think critically who can speak the language, whatever the language is. And um, a lot of, at least in our case, for our students, a lot of that work, uh, we have to pick it up because it didn't happen at the K-12 level. Um, and so I think there's a way to integrate it in a way that um, now you can test out of it, if that's your question. And in some ways, we already do that, right? But I think, I think those are minimum skills that we have to be able to certify that we pass on uh, when we graduate a student into the workforce. Does that answer your question? Good, thank you. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am, in, in the back. So um, I mentioned the Capital Builders Program, um, and that is uh, where we assess with this BP-10 assessment product um, from Gallup. Um, every, gra every high school graduate who is interested in a full ride scholarship. And uh, we pick the top 20 and we put them in an 18 month program where they get, they get a suit, they get a computer, they get free tuition for 18 months, they get a housing subsidy, uh, they get an apprenticeship and an internship, and um, they get to pitch a business at the end of the, to, to, to venture capitalists. And the interesting thing, uh, back to the lady that asked the previous question, is that um, they, get a, they get a certificate at the end of the program that will allow them to, to leave us after 18 months with a higher, ed, higher education certification in entrepreneurship. And some of them may come back for the next level of, uh, of certification. Some may go off and get rich, which we're hoping, like Bill Gates, and uh, you know, come back and, uh, by the way, I want you to, he, he also mentioned Amazon and the, and the, um, the, the headquarters. I actually wrote a letter to, um, to Jeff Bezos, and I offered him UDC. Uh, you know, I said, look, you know, we're about uh, workforce credentialing, and we're developing a new model, and we sure could use a partner to help us think it through. Uh, he hasn't answered me yet, but I'm, I'm ever hopeful. <laughs> yes, sir. Sure. Um, um, interesting question, uh, because I'm in middle, middle of union negotiations as we speak. Um, so um, we've been able to recruit 70 young new faculty members in the last three years. Very bright, uh, Yale, Harvard, MIT, uh, because they all want to get into the district, right? And our challenge for some of them, especially engineers and business faculty, is that when they perform well, the other schools around us, you know, rate us. Um, and so our, our challenge is this in these negotiations. Uh, for the most part, the liberal arts faculty are paid at or above market. The engineers and the business school faculty are paid below market. Uh, the business school faculty are 40% uh, off of market in some cases. And so we've been, with, with tricks, we've been able to sort of work around that but it's a structural issue we have to resolve. And the challenge for us is that the liberal arts faculty outnumber everybody else and they control the union. And so uh, we're in the middle of those conversations as we speak. Uh, yes, ma'am, in the back. Uh, 
One more question. Well, he's, he's had his hand up a while. Yes, sir. Sure. Well, I'll answer your question, and then I'll tell you the real question, right? Um, I think the answer is yes. Um, you know, the market needs will drive uh, the need to figure out ways to identify talent. You know, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, a degree is just a credential, right? You know, it's a credential that says that you know this student has a certain skill in a certain area and is able to do certain things. That's what credentials do, right? Uh, the problem, though, is that, and nobody commented on my little piece about the Atlantic article, uh, and I'm assuming that's because it's, it's a hard conversation to have, but the problem is that, if you really think about it, um, we've been credentialing students as certified to succeed in a, in a, war, in a country based on a philosophy of white privilege. You follow me? And as long as that philosophy is there, the credential doesn't make a whole lot of difference. Uh, because if you listen to Mr. Saylor about his, um, you know, the things that he assessed, right? You know, I'm, I'm sure, you know, you bring that philosophy into whatever credentialing you're trying to do because that's the environment in which you're trying to be successful. Uh, so until we examine how that philosophy is minimizing our ability to our ability, desire, and wherewithal to identify other types of talent, and most of it is in this vast pool of the 90 percent, you know, our, the credentials will change how we identify the talent, but it may not change what talent is being identified. Does that answer your question? Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Is that it, sir? Thank you all very much. I enjoyed it.